All right, we're online, we are recording. We're not online, we're just recording the game and publish that later whenever we feel ready to do so. This is Lab Shack, and at Lab Shack we play amazing games and sometimes even games from people who are also playing at Lab Shack, which is somehow self-referential. And I like that because it also leads us to the topic of the debate. Self-referential arguments are the best arguments because you can't refuse them because they support themselves, right? Maybe a useful thought for the game we are playing, which is Getting to Philosophy by Jason Morningstar and Lizzie Stark, which will be published uh, soon in a collection of short games. This is a really a short game. It's just one page long. And then there's another page for the example. I will share the document with you. Um, so you can have a look yourself and don't have to rely on my words because I might be biased. In this game, you can win. Therefore, I have a reason to not give you full information. Um, and you win by reaching philosophy. And where do we reach philosophy? On Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is the place where we play this game. It's our playground in this game. And now I tell you how it actually works. Getting to philosophy is a lighthearted game where we play stubborn philosophers or decision makers or whatever we will come up with a scenario for that but it's usually just philosophers or people arguing with each other with very strong opinions very stubborn people um, but they have a restriction in the way they can push forward their argument and that is they have to follow a trail of wikipedia pages and you can only use arguments from the Wikipedia page you are on. Everybody has to have a separate window open with Wikipedia, the English Wikipedia, by the way. Good for you. Um, and um, we start with a random article, each of us, with an individual random article. And you only can use the information you find on that page to push your argument. Then, while the others are talking, we go around in circles, arguing. When it's your turn again, you have already clicked three times in your Wikipedia page on the first link. And importantly, the first link, which is not in brackets, because that is usually something like a language reference and brings you to a path we don't want to follow. But the first link, which is an actual link to another Wikipedia page, and since we do that privately, sometimes you can cheat if you think like, this is really not the way I want to go. You can also take the second one. That's totally okay. People do that in debates all the times. Um, but usually you take the first link and the interesting effect what uh, is coming with that is that you usually go a level of abstraction further up. So from a specific town, you go to a region from that region to you go to the nation and the nation goes to the nation state and the nation state goes to and so on and so forth. So there's a chance to reach philosophy. And because we are four people, usually you play the game with two people only, we jump three links ahead. So you go three links further up the road. So we have a chance to reach um, philosophy in the time we have because um, the game is over when we have played 30 or 40 minutes, that's up to us how long we want to play. I would suggest with four people, 30 minutes is okay. So from the start to the end, it's 30 minutes, then the game is over. The game is over earlier when one of us has reached philosophy or if one of us has gotten into a loop and has reached again a page where they have already been on. Then the game is also over. And the person who has reached the loop is signaling that to us, either in the chat or you build it into your argument. Sometimes we can smell it from the way you discuss that you have reached philosophy or that you have reached a loop. And then what happens then is that everybody else has one more turn to explain how wrong they were and how right the other person was and that you now fully support the argument. That is how the game could end. Also after 30 minutes, because then it has to come to an end. Sometimes people just end up in directions which don't lead anywhere. So we need to have a time frame for that. One day I want to play the game with a promise to only let it end when you reach philosophy or a loop. 
and see how long it could go. <laughs> Maybe that game will then al already end after seven minutes. I have seen such games. If we end that early, we could discuss if we want to play a, 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 a second time or not. But that is then also funny in its own sense, I would say. All right, safety for sure. We have also at the table, there's the X card and we can use the chat or just verbally express the X card, just stepping out of character for a moment and say, uh, can we dismiss that topic? Also, you have a private X card. That is when you come up on a, land on a Wikipedia page where the content is just not your taste for whatever reason, just ignore it, go anywhere else, click on random again, go to the next, whatever works for you best at that moment. Inconvenient articles don't have to be followed. Like for example, in the last game I played, I started with um, a, a Jewish cemetery. And for a moment I was hesit hesitant if the lighthearted nature of the game uh, works with a destroyed Jewish cemetery as first article. Then I found a way to honor the article and the content of the article and somehow build it in. But for a moment that I thought about using my right to just ignore that moment. But then again, ignoring that is also not the right approach. So I was really torn on that. And I thought like honoring the dead is then my argument. Okay, that's how the game works. However, we need a setup. There's no character creation or anything. This is a short and fun game come up with a character on the spot, argue the way you would argue, or maybe something along the lines of your argument. But what we need is we need to find um, an argument, like a question we all discuss and where we all have different solutions for. So that could be, what's the sense of life? That could be, what's the best way to spend public money? infrastructure, transport, um, equal distribution to everybody. That could also be a discussion topic. Public investment, very important to have a clear opinion on that. For example, we use Wikipedia as an inspiration guide for that as well. So if you could all now go to Wikipedia, um, I will do that too, not to the German one, no. And it takes a moment for me to load. And then you click on random article on, on the left. And that gives you some weird article possibly. Kevin, what have you reached there? Um, it's about the K7 bridge, which is uh, an automobile bridge across the Kansas River. Uh, it's one sentence long. <laughs> Wonderful. So this is our first inspiration spot. Uh, Heather, what have you reached? So I have landed on a place, a suburb in New South Wales, Australia called North Arm Cove. A bridge, a village, was it right? Yeah. And Ruther? Um, I uh, have a page about Larry Druffel, an American engineer, director emeritus, and visiting scientist at Carnegie Mellon. Very good. Scientist, engineer. And I have the Belcher Islands in Ontario or Quebec or somewhere in between. Um, southeast part of the Hudson Bay. So to me, it seems that nature is, seems very important in what we have gathered here. And we have an, a bridge, an engineer. I see a pattern there. What, what do you think? What question could we discuss thinking about these places, uh, these articles came up with? For me, Maybe. the yeah. Maybe we could talk about um, the uh, I'm, I'm, I can see it very clearly in my head, but I'm struggling to articulate exactly what it is. Um, we have a moment. Maybe we could argue about um, the 
tension between urban development and natural preservation. Perfect. For me. For you too? Yes. Hello yeah, too? Works. Okay. So it, it makes sense to, to make a note somewhere about this because we might forget about the topic we actually discussed that could happen in, in, in the best debates. So there's a tension. I might need a pen which works. So in the end, between human and nature, right? It's like urban development and nature preservation. So each of us has now, from the article they were on, find their argument. So what is your discussion point which you will defend until the end of the, the day? I have these Belcher Islands, for example, islands, and that is an a nature reservoir. So I'm looking through this article now, and some people have it easier looking just through one sentence, thinking about what could be the argument they are defending and what they think how urban development versus nature preservation should be handled. So I, my, I have my argument. I think it should be completely separated. So there should be a, a very strict distinction between where development can happen and where nature happens. No interaction. That's my argument. No interaction. My article is all about a a suburb and a very old suburb. So I think I'm gonna take the opposite argument, Garrett, and say that there shouldn't be any division. Nature should be part of where humans live and uh, everything should be very sprawled out and mixed together. Mm -hmm. So wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I think that development should be prioritized. So my, my one sentence is talking about how this bridge is connecting two cities. So, you know, developing allows people to get to each other and to build connections. So that really is the most important thing is kind of connecting human society and like making sure that people can get to each other easily. So, um, so yeah, nature. Mm. <laughs> uh, nature, so you, don't care about nature. Exactly, yeah. Okay, Ruth. I think it is very important that we preserve nature in a way that it can be studied and learned from. Ooh. Yeah, you could get on that track easily, but it's also misleading, I, I will tell you later. Okay, so what we do now is we need to, uh, as you might know that on, on Zoom, the order we have the, in, in gallery view, the order everybody appears in is diff different for everybody. So I, in the game, we go in turns, but my turn order, just looking at the pictures is different from yours. So we need to fix that in the chat and say which turn order over we have. Since I'm the facilitator, I would push my argument first. And then I would say, Ruben, it's your turn. And then it's Kevin. And then it's Kevin. That is my screen order. <laughs> so that makes it easier for me. It's my facilitator privilege and also my way to win this game. Um, for sure. So that is the turn order. And that means when you have brought your argument through, then the next person in this list is it's their turn. And I follow through my Wikipedia links in the meantime. Okay. Then are you ready for the game? Then let's have 30 minutes. That means 10 to the full hour is it is over. Maybe one of us has won until then. Otherwise not. 
Okay, I click on random article and each of you also now clicks on random article and we start with a fresh new random article with something completely different. And from there on, we don't click on random article anymore, but just follow the abstraction levels up, maybe. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Nature. Urban development. We have important decisions to make nowadays. Humankind has reached a state where they have to make a decision. Can we live together with nature? Can nature still live without us? This question has to be answered today because we have reached a level of intermingling these two areas, which will bring us on a, on a path which we'll, we'll never be able to return. And therefore I say, today is the day we have to make the decision and separate us forever and keep nature and human apart, like two islands. Let's put an ocean between us. Let's make the nature continent and the human continent. And this is how we can go to the future. But how to do so and how to explain to others who haven't reached this point of thought yet? I can tell you. Look, for example, at the history of music. Look, for example, how music has developed from something coming from nature, like crashing a stone on another stone makes a noise to music nowadays. For example, uh, psychedelic rock. Psychedelic rock is something which has reached a point where you take drugs to reach a natural state of mind and bring that into synthetic instruments like electric guitars and stuff like that. So Vitamin Enhanced, for example, was a six disc box set by English psychedelic rock band Osric Tentacles with their first six records. I just recently listened to them, so I think it's a very good example here. And they have, for example, very clearly shown that you can combine this in your abstract mind, but the end result still shows there is a separation. So you start with nature, you end with something synthetical, and the way in between is something which can only happen on the abstract level. I hope you can follow me. Thank you. I think it is uh, very interesting that you bring up the matter of uh, the oceans because um, much like the desert, I think you'll find that the ocean has a lot of nature in it. There are many plants and animals who live there and we can never truly, um, even if we were to separate nature and civilization on two islands, uh, we would still be surrounded by nature uh, on the civilization island. And I think that is important to be aware of because um, just as the oceans are full of nature, I think that even in the middle of the desert, I think that even in uh, the middle of Arizona, if you lived in a populated place situated in Gila County, you would still need to be aware of, of all of the nature that is around you and how that impacts your daily life. I think, uh, I think Ruben makes a great point. I think that we have to think of nature and human development as completely interdependent and should be um, not divided, should be, to, should be blended together. Um, and there's a great example of a place that does that, New Zealand is able to maintain a rural character. Um, and the New Zealand Security Intelligence Service uh, maintains order and uh, works with a Oh, have their gun mute. Thanks. Even though it's a very small place, um, they're still able to play a role in domestic intelligence and counter subversion uh, around the world. Um, yeah, I, those are some very interesting points. Um, so, 
you know, when we're, we're thinking about nature, uh, I like to think about uh, national parks and especially the provincial parks of British Columbia. Um, there's one particular one uh, at Dina Lake, uh, and that is kind of a park on a lake and there's a campground and fishing and they're just all of these kind of developments there and you know we're talking about how human development and nature interact and in this case it's human development that allows this to be a worthwhile place to go we have all of these campsites built up and this you know special fish fishing place constructed and without that like no one would be able to appreciate anything that's there no one would have any good experiences so yeah i think this is a really good microcosm of this whole issue but that's the, that's the problem with your argument it's a microcosm and we need to look this from a microscopic perspective we're looking from a global perspective on this and so if we would follow your argument then we would soon not be able to distinguish nature and and human and urban urban elements at all anymore and i'm thinking about um the 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 concept of uh, sayak which is a malay concept of um putting anthologies together and these are like proses and drama scripts and pantoons and um, like, for example, the famous Sengtai Kata Untuk Albirasa, just to mention one. And they have already learned, like, and this is like hundreds of years ago, that um, when you put, up, put together an anthology, you need to separate them theme by theme. Put like one theme in one and the other theme in the next chapter, right? chapter by chapter this is how we organize our work this is how we organize our thinking and therefore this is also how we should organize this planet it's interesting that you mention uh organization because one way that uh humans like to organize things is through language um such as uh, the Southern Athabascan, also known as Apachean language, which is uh, spoken primarily in the Southwestern United States. Um, it's important that uh, we be able to name, uh, name what's going on around us, and language is one way that we do that. That's an, that's an excellent point. And I would also um, suggest that we consider the ways in which we, while are uh, very separate and very internally focused, for example, focused on our own uh, national or community interests, we can also work globally. Uh, that's what international law is all about. So, International law, also known as public international law and the law of nations. And if we can work together as a global community with treaties, international customs, um, sovereign states working together, why can't we work together to make sure that both the natural world and human development um, can also have a treaty and also um, find governance structures that work? So that both can can be united together. Yeah, it's really interesting that both of you have mentioned kind of these systems of human organization, um, because one one kind of organizational system I've been thinking about is an administrative division, which is kind of a way of subdividing a country into different regions. It's almost like zoning in a city. Um, and that is a great way to kind of see what's an urban versus a rural area, uh, what's a municipality, what's a, a borough, a city, a township, all of these things. Um, and, you know, it's these systems of human organization that make the world run and let us know what's appropriate to develop in certain places or not, and kind of how we can continue spreading our infrastructure and colonizing and making the world 
better for people who are the ones who really matter. So I'm glad that you supported my argument for me. Well, half of your argument, because you forget about nature all the time. And now I think, I think the discussion has reached a point where we need some clarification here. And that is, what we are missing is like a structural dialogue, something which, well, let's us, let us use together the framework of pragma dialectics. Pragma dialectics was developed by scholars of the University of Amsterdam, and it's very helpful for us to understand where we all stand and where, where this discussion can go. It starts with confrontation. Confrontation is that you don't agree with me. The opening is then that I explain to you why it is important to separate nature and um, urban development completely. And I have done that already. The argumentation has followed and you have listened and I hope understood that the point is unavoidable, the one I made. So I'm coming now to the conclusion following the structure of pragma dialectics, and that is that we could soon, I hope, finish this discussion with coming to the one and only possible conclusion here, that the separation is the only way forward because it combines all the aspects you are describing and brings it to a wholesome final argument. Right? Uh, I thought it was particularly interesting that Kevin brought up um, administrative organizations because there are so many different ways that uh, humans have historically organized themselves into um, groups of identity, groups of administration, social groups. Um, I feel like today a lot of the development that we think about is, you know, you live in a county, you live in a city, you go to the bar, I don't know, whatever. Um, you you build a tall building and, and lots of people go live in tall buildings and um, and it's very, uh, like it's very sort of, um, you know, this is, this is a park, this is a shopping mall, this is a car garage. Um, but that uh, even before there were shopping malls and car garages, uh, some of the places we live were inhabited by indigenous peoples and um, they had very different ways of organizing themselves and doing things. And I just think that's important to, uh, to remember and to be conscientious that there are still people who are um, uh, in touch with those traditions and cultures. A very astute point, Ruthann. I think if we're going to continue to take a step back and look at um, you know, what what is human development and and what does it mean now and what has it meant in the past, uh, we're going to want to think about um, uh, units of measurement in social sciences. So I want to bring everyone to mind of uh, the term a level of analysis which is used in the social sciences to point to the location size or scale of a research target now we could be talking about analytical levels at the micro level the meso level the macro level these are all levels we should keep in mind when we're talking about uh, types of human development I, and i think it's just uh, very important to, to get back to uh, brass tacks yeah, while we're talking about levels of development and organization, I think one very important level is at the macro level, um, which is that of a nation, um, which is kind of one of the biggest organizational structures of people. Um, so you can define a nation as a cultural political community that has become conscious of its autonomy. Uh, so it's kind of the opposite of that micro level, it's it's um, a macro group of people that is aware of its own interests and is advancing them and is advancing them through developing and kind of maintaining their own territory. Um, so really like, I think when we think about people, we have to think about 
ourselves as nations that are interacting with each other on that scale and are kind of developing and taking control of our own territory um, and, you know, serving our interests. I'm very glad that you all finally agreed and understood that we need to take this to a macroscopic or I would even say holistic level. I would even go one step further now and um, go to the one of the oldest testaments, the Old Testament, um, back and bring in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What is happening there? Let's quote it, man from God. And the Lord God said, behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And what happened? They were expelled from paradise, from nature. Separation. Adam and Eve would not have done their urban development of an, on, the, on, on, on paradise. They first had to be expelled. This is how it all started. And now we have reached that point again. We need to create paradise as separate from us to be a real paradise. That's a really interesting take. Um, I hadn't considered the possibility of uh, creating a paradise. It seems like one of the fundamental principles of nature is that it exists of its own accord rather than by human intervention. Um, and it seems to me, in fact, that if we were to build a paradise by human intervention, um, it would be an important historical record for future generations. Uh, but if we were to leave it undisturbed, we would never know about that because one way that we learn about um, how ancient people did things is through archeology span and presumably um, any human, most any human intervention, certainly any construction that we would do nowadays would leave a, a series of historical artifacts um, and we would, definitely not be able to learn as much as we could if we um, left that paradise fully, fully unexplored. Um, while I so appreciate bringing the humanities in to any argument, uh, I'd like to ask us to uh, consider the role of science, just science in this discussion, you know, a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the universe. And if we, if we get back to science and uh, back to the roots of science in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, in observing the natural world, making predictions, coming up with explanations, um, I think that will point us in the direction that we cannot actually separate ourselves from the natural world. We should not attempt to separate ourselves from the natural world, lest we lose track of um, this path that we have been on for such a long time to expand our knowledge and understanding of the world. So Heather, I think it's really interesting that you bring up science in that Garrett and Rifan, you're both talking about the humanities and kind of, you know, more of the social side of things, because I think we can unify both of those things and look at the social sciences, uh, which is applying kind of scientific principles to philosophical or kind of cultural ideas. Um, and I think having that rigorousness will allow us to really see what's important and to kind of to see humanity's place in the forefront of all of this discovery and how important we are to the world and to learning and growing and kind of 
having mastery over everything we see. Having mastery in everything what we do. And that can only happen if we have a proper separation, not destruction of nature. Kevin, we can't live without nature. And ever has, ever has shown in my, in, in my biblical testament, there is no way to exist for humans without nature. We need to live both, but separate. Same, but different. And looking at science, Heather, I, can, I, can, I, I completely agree. Without science, we won't reach a conclusion here. But there's one master science, and that is mathematical logic. And with mathematical logic, we have a tool for proper judgment on facts like this. And maybe it helps you if I explain it in a more metaphorical manner, and that is humans are the free variable in our first order language here, which we talk. And what do you need to do with free variables? You need to eliminate them through judgments, through deduction systems and rule of inferences, natural deduction. And then we have logic, which is, which is nature, separate from the free, free variables, which are then eliminated and in their own state, like or Hilbert would say, like a Hilbert space. And this is where they can still live. I think that is the conclusion, isn't it? It's, uh, I'm glad you brought up mathematical logic because that is a type of system, I think, a, a group of interacting or interrelated entities that form a unified whole, much like humans and nature. Um, and uh, they're described by their spatial and temporal boundaries and surrounded and influenced by their environment. So I think what that says to me is that even if you have things that are unified but separate, they still have to be more unified than they are separate. It's an interesting argument. Um, interesting for sure. I, I think that as, as much as we want to bring um, science and logic into this discussion. Um, we should think really hard about other examples of what happens when you um, separate yourself um, from uh, a source of, of knowledge. So we don't want our interaction with nature to become like an extinct language, an extinct language, a language that no longer has any speakers uh, and no living descendants. It's not just a dead language, it is extinct. And our ability to interact with the natural world could become like an extinct language. Um, and we don't want to abandon that uh, connection to the natural world the way that extinct languages have been abandoned uh, by their former speakers. Yeah, I think thinking about um, extinct languages is very important. Um, there are a lot of human endeavors that end up getting washed away uh, because we don't know how to access them anymore. Um, because really like knowledge is the most important human resource. Um, knowledge is actually kind of hard to define. Uh, Plato described it as a statement that meets three criteria. It must be justified, true, and believed. Um, so, you know, we're using language to describe these things. We're, we're kind of trying to differentiate between 
the natural world and things that we create. Um, but really kind of we are as humans, the ones who hold knowledge and who can make the best decisions based on the things that we know. Um, you know, the ability to justify things and believe them is kind of unique to people having that capacity for abstract thought. Um, so I think it's our duty to use that capacity to um, further our own interests as much as we possibly can and collect more knowledge and learn more and uh, spread that knowledge around. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's the most important thing. Yeah, that's a, a thoughtful ending for a good, not completely convincing argument, I would say. Sometimes it's easier to put ourselves back into the mind of a child and to come to a better conclusion. Like what is one of the first things the child learns? It's counting, like counting numbers, one, two, three, what comes after three, four, and so on. And looking at counting, we know that there are differences between inclusive counting and exclusive counting, for example. And uh, counting works very differently. Looking at language, for example, there is like, because people couldn't count that far, they came up with words like a dozen. A dozen or in, in French, counts, like 15 is suddenly a completely different word. Um, and then only later we, we learned that a decimal system is a much better way to express it. So we shouldn't say a dozen, but 10, 12. 22, not 12, yeah, right? That doesn't make sense. And what has happening there is that there was not a proper separation of the abstract kind of thinking, what is urban development, like a decision-making process, and nature, which is organic and just growing. And we see this, this leads to problems. And when children learn to, learn to count, they stumble over these borders where suddenly there is a system and it should have been there before, but it isn't. And the proper separation in language and saying 10-1 instead of 11 would make so much more sense with the separation between urban development and nature. We now have the chance to make a proper separation. So now, please follow me. Follow me in this direction. It's really interesting that you brought up uh, counting and early childhood education. Um, and Kevin, it was really interesting that you brought up um, how humans think about things because categorization is something that humans and other organisms do. Um, but the interesting thing about categorization is that uh, if you sort things into categories, then you also have the opportunity necessarily to sort things into the wrong categories. You can, you can do the right thing with the right kind of thing, but that means that there also is a wrong thing. And there is a wrong thing that you can do and a wrong thing that you can do it with. And um, I just don't know how, uh, it, I, I think it's important to think about when we're thinking about the interaction between development and nature, whether we are categorizing things correctly um, and whether the categorizations we are making actually separate things that ought not be separated. An interesting, it's an interesting point. I, I wonder if we're talking about the natural world, we shouldn't reach much further back uh, and consider grounding our arguments in arguments that were made in uh, the ancient Greek language. So not in Mycenaean Greek that preceded it, not in the medieval Greek, that succeeded it. But in the ancient Greek, that was the language of Homer, of fifth century Athenian historians, playwrights, and philosophers. Uh, I think that is probably where we should really start if we, if we want to, to talk about the natural world, really reach back to uh, that early study, that early sort of um, scientific inquiry uh, and and really, if you haven't been reading ancient Greek lately, I'm not sure how you can can make some of these arguments. Well, <clears throat> yeah, it, Heather, it's funny that you mention 
language and Ruthann, you're mentioning categorization, um, which is, you know, something that all animals do and Garrett talking about mathematics um, and kind of those abstract concepts of numbers and how abstraction became important in counting more than our fingers and toes. Um, and all of these things are really objects of the mind, uh, things that exist only in imagination, like language is something completely made up, like we might have some symbols that represent it, but it's really just an idea in our heads. Um, and that really forefronts how important our minds are, how important ideas are, and our ability to create abstract concepts and kind of really just categorize everything in the world and create these systems of communication. Um, so I don't know, our minds are pretty amazing and I think we need to keep using them to their utmost ability to do the most for ourselves that we can and to keep creating and striving and being human. So I think that's our time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, let's go one time around, one last time around, and with like a little bit more understanding for each other's position. And I can I can tell you that like for me this all feels like ideasthesia, like where in this discussion my mind opened, and I I feel enriched by your positions, and I could finally see that there's something more beyond the point I tried to make the whole time. And there was sense in all of your arguments. Um, I, ideas thesia is, is like the best concept for me to describe this, how synthet synth synesthetic experiences suddenly reached my brain and allowed me to go beyond my stubbornness in this. Thank you so much. I, yeah, I really feel like everybody's statements have been wonderful. I, I think it is important that uh, I think it is important, like, obviously, I think it is important that we be in contact with nature, but I think it's also important that we differentiate, as, as Garrett has been saying, between what is nature, what isn't nature, so that we can correctly um, apply the principles of science to, to the things that we're learning and doing. Well, I, for one, have been given a lot to think about um, in the course of our argument. I think this idea of, of thinking a little more strictly about the difference between human development and the natural world is important. Um, I feel really inspired by your arguments. I am going to look to Eurasia, the largest continental area on earth, um, and see if I can find other examples of, of ways that the um, the points you've made, Garrett, have, have been successfully uh, implemented. Yeah, I really, I really got a lot out of this conversation, um, you know, learning from everyone else's philosophies. Um, <laughs> and I really like going from my viewpoint of kind of people being the most important thing. Um, you know, there are, there is a place for nature and there is a place for studying and learning from it. And like, it is very va valuable and shouldn't be discounted or exploited. So I think that's something that should be taken into account when we're looking at the advancement of human civilization. So a lot to think about. Thank you for playing Getting to Philosophy. That was our discussion. That was super fun. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> yeah, that was really cool. And yeah, I, I did get to philosophy on that last. <laughs> oh, that wow. Me too. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so As close. A, so one, one round further, I would have reached philosophy. Yeah, and you would have won, Kevin. Oh, my God. Yeah. But w uh, I, what a nice ending. <laughs> yes. I actually was about to hit a loop from science to Latin to classical language <sighs> to language, to structure, and back to science, I think. I clicked ahead a little bit. <laughs> yes. I know that loop. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> <laughs>
the loop towards which all paths converge. L Latin is a trap, yes, in German too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you very much for playing. Was yeah, thank you for running this. Yeah, yeah, thank you. A lot of fun, yes. Really fun. And um, yeah, the, um, I, I, I really in, in enjoyed this, this seriosity of this discussion. It was like very honest, very direct and connecting dots. Yeah. Yes, I, I really enjoyed it. Okay, I stop with the recording. If you want to, you can stay a little bit longer with me in this um, you know, four more minutes before the slot is over. <laughs> so 